Okay, well, thank you all for coming. I'm Marty Kine, I'm a SVP, and uh, my role is to uh, help with the strategy of the marketing cloud at Salesforce. And today I wanna to talk about the future of customer data, my favorite topic. Uh, I apologize in advance, my cat will show up at some point, uh, Jerry. I'm coming to you, by the way, from uh, Katona, New York, which is about 40 miles northeast of the city. And uh, it's a lovely verdant place and a lovely day today. So I hope you all are doing well and staying safe and sane. Uh, I wanna start by going into the past. And my presentation today, it's, it's brief, but it has two parts. The first part is about marketing technology and um, uh, the category customer data platform that's part of it and then identity management and then the second part is more about brands and the, the impact of customer data on the modern brand what i'm what i call the unbrand so i want to go back in time for many 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 years um, before many of you were born actually um, it was a time when um oh there's my cat again shows up very nostalgic for the days of travel uh, it was a time back in the early 60s when um most media, mass media was done on television and radio, so it's what we would call linear formats. Digital marketing didn't exist. And yet there was this out output, and this is a true story here, the Society of the Divine Savior Data Processing Center. And it existed, it's real, and it existed in the middle of um, rural Wisconsin. They had quite a fancy operation out there. It was a direct mail operation. It's a Catholic society, and basically they sent out letters to the flock soliciting donations for various causes. They used an IBM 600 um, Series 950 data processing system. They paid IBM $12,000 a month for this thing. So in today's dollars, this would be a $2 million a year commitment for the equipment data processing, and then also those, those um, automated typewriters you see on the right. This system was capable of inputting 500 punch cards. Punch cards were the way you, put, where you spoke to computers in those days. Punch cards per hour and outputting 1,000 mailing labels. Those typewriters on the right uh, were very busy. They could output 800 lines of, uh, of customized letterhead um, in a minute. And so they... Uh, the output of this data processing system was um, was massive. They had a response rate of uh, 80 percent, 80 percent, which by in today's terms is miraculous. And this is their Martech stack. So they have the card inputs, as I said, they have data tapes. And in those days, data was stored on magnetic tape, literally, literally real to real tape. Then the IBM processor, which is the, the brains of this. The label printer, so they had one channel, as I said, uh, direct mail, and they printed labels, and then they did measurement, which was basically the responses coming back in, those 80% responses, they'd be tabulated by a person and then re-input through card inputs back onto the data tapes. What was most interesting to me about this operation, the, uh, in spite of actually its sophistication, for the time, because they were actually doing a lot more than I thought was possible in 1962, uh, before even I was born, believe it or not. Um, what, what was very interesting to me is that they had for every single customer a row of um, 256 characters, alphanumeric characters that was encoded data about a customer. And what it had was uh, name and address, obviously, so personally identifiable information. And it had their um, presence of children in the household. It had likelihood to respond to certain campaigns. And then it had what we would call predictive models, so the output of statistical models um, recommending future campaigns for them and also a, a lifetime value model, so how valuable were they as donors. A lot of very sophisticated customer data modeling, and I would say that today we are still trying to recreate that, that utopia of 1962. Things got more difficult over time. There are more channels, there's a lot more data, customers are um, much more sort of fickle, and there's just a lot more complexity, as we'll say. But, you know, two years ago, I wrote this when I was at Gartner as an analyst. I covered a category called the customer data platform, and it was, you know, sort of emerging in the early 2018, even though it started in 2013. Uh, and I wrote this column, what is this thing we call the CDP? And as I thought about it over time, um, the, the terms of the conversation around the customer data platform are very reminiscent. They're extremely similar and in some cases identical to the terms of the conversation around marketing automation in the 1990s. Um, we started with database marketing, obviously, in 19. 
80s and actually in the 60s as we've seen and then in the 1990s marketing automation started to, to appear and that was essentially creating an application and a database in the single in the same spot in the 2000s um, companies like exact target appeared who did multi-channel campaign management so that was b2c scale sequencing of messages doing split tests uh, a better ui so more sort of user-friendly ui less coding and um now in the in kind of the 2010s and, and into the 2020s, we have the CDP category. And essentially what I would argue is that it's all the same. It's all really dealing with customer data uh, in an automated, more and more automated fashion. In the 90s, CRM for marketing promised single view of the customer. Look up the um, sales pitches. Single view of the customer, the, the ability to activate across multiple channels, including email, by the way, um, in the in the later 90s. And then, uh, you know, the ability to do good measurement and good segment it's exactly what CDPs promise. So I think it's an evolution of the CRM category. Um, we'll get we'll get more to CDPs in a second, but um, there's also going on in the market a number of major forces, and these are the four that we've identified using our research. And some of them are more intuitive than others. And and this these are things that no enterprise can ignore. Um, Competitive differentiation is built on it. Quickly, it's integration. So moving from siloed channels, the email team over here, and this is tech and teams, the email team over here, the web team, the mobile team, the social team, to more of a platform approach. You've got to be more nimble approaching, um, breaking down the, the silos between teams, but also between customer data sources. Identity, so trying to get as close to people as you can, a people-based identifier with consent. AI goes without saying, predicting the future using models. And then the speed is using, going from pre-planned campaigns, uh, things that you plan years, months, weeks in advance to trying to react in the moment where possible. The other thing that's going on is the marketing function itself has changed a lot. Back in 2001, when I graduated from business school, you could really tell people who wanted to get into marketing, they didn't look like this guy <laughs> at my business school. But uh, you could tell sort of by looking at them. They were a little bit more slick, a little bit more put together. They were a lot more interested in celebrities. And uh, the people who wanted to get into finance looked more like this guy. Today, mar the marketing as a function is, is completely different. It's, it's actually a combination of both. It's, it's a bimodal career. You need to be good with celebrities still. You still need to worry about fonts, um, uh, intros and outros in your, in your spots, your video spots. But on the other hand, you need to be a statistician. You need to be able to deliver instructions to a bench of Russian PhDs in data science. Uh, and I'm not kidding. You need to be able to do both, which is why CMOs are so stressed out. So the other thing that has been happening, and I think this, this explains most of the CDP phenomenon, is that the median number of data sources used by organizations has exploded. It's, it's rising at a rate, and these are significant data sources. If you, actually, if you go to, and somebody did, went to Unilever and said, how many different applications do you use? They said something over 400 in marketing. Um, and all of those probably have some customer data sitting in them. But if you think about significant marketing sources like a loyalty database, CRM database, point of sale system, uh, maybe your, um, your web analytics platform, if you count those, they've been going up at a rate of 25% a year. Now, 25% compound annual growth rate is really, really scary. In one in 10 years, if you do the math here, the simple math based on these numbers, we are going to have 140 different data sources used by marketing organizations. And if you go out 100 years, and I did this just for fun, uh, it's well over a billion. You could do the math yourself. But so this is not a, a sustainable situation. Something has got to be done to integrate data. And if you know anything about Salesforce, MuleSoft, Datarama, integration is probably where the biggest investments and bets are going on today. Um, all roads lead to not, they don't read, lead to Taylor Swift. Well, at the end of my presentation, I will tell you how maybe they do. Um, but basically, all this is an IoT example. All roads lead to the individual. So you're trying to pivot technology, these different channels, from looking at campaigns or looking at um, uh, different channels, like a, a channel to the customer, to pointing toward individuals with their consent. And that's a massive shift. If you think about trying to coordinate everything that you're doing, rather than you know emails to to uh, an email list on a campaign, everything that you're doing to an individual and reflecting everything that that person, every interaction that person has had with your brand, you can see the investment in both the underlying customer data infrastructure, but also the the depth of understanding that you're going to need and to trust with your 
with your customer. And customers continue to change. Their expectations keep changing. I think that's what makes, for me anyway, marketing so fun. You never know what the heck's happening. Um, in general, 64% of consumers expect brands to engage with them in real time. What does that mean, real time? I think there's a lot of under, misunderstanding about it, but I think of um, Bruce Lee. This is my analogy. Bruce Lee was always surrounded by these enemies, you know, and he, he, of course, beat them all. But they would come at him one at a time. And when I was a kid, I was like telling my dad, I'm like, why don't they all just kind of rush at him all at once and they could get him? Um, well, they didn't. And maybe because they were scared or whatever. But what Bruce Lee did, and he did engage with them in real time, is he, he, he um, did what he needed to do to get the job done. So real time actually means being able to meet the customer in the moment. It doesn't mean taking care of everything at once. So when we analyze what marketers were asking for, we at Salesforce and in, in my previous job as well, what marketers were asking for when they wanted a CDP, we recognize that it's, it's a real need. They're affecting a real need and real pain. And it basically boils down into two categories. One is what I was just talking about, real time personalization. They, they wanna be able to deliver the right um, message or offer, say on a website, based on behavior that's happening there in that moment. So if someone's looking at, in the shoe category, they obviously are giving you signals that they're interested in this category. Why would you give them an offer for something else? So that category, and I would call that engagement, system of engagement. And then the other one's more kind of a single view of the customer. That is a persistent data store of customer information that you can then do great AI or great modeling on. A, an idealized marketing cloud then, given what I've said before, would include these components. Number one, a unified user profile. So that's actually the key. That's, that's, got, that's the foundation for um, advanced analytics, and it's also the foundation for measurement and optimization, and it's the foundation for trusted relationships with customers. Two smart segments, that's the analytic layer. Planning and reacting. So planning is being able to plan campaigns in advance, particularly for those who don't come to your site, who don't open your app. Um, you have to be able to reach them somehow. So that's asynchronous campaign. And then reaction, if somebody arrives and starts exhibiting behaviors, as I said in the shoe, the shoe example earlier, you need to be able to personalize that. And in, in our terms, we would call that um, the world of the journey builder or campaign management. And then react would be more an uh, interaction studio. And then you need to be able to reach them on the channels of choice. That's what's on top. And then uh, analyze, which goes to that saying. And the, the sixth there is uh, integrating with the other parts of the organization. Marketing is no longer um, in its own world, very much not. It's very close to and should be very closely aligned with service, with sales, uh, with commerce in particular. And the other thing, and this is the last of my um, architecture diagrams, is, is this idea of managing proxy and person data in the same platform. This is sort of doubling down on that bottom layer, which was the unified user profile. If you think about the customer journey, so let's just think about it as a thought experiment. Somebody exists in the world, they don't know your brand. Um, so they're unknown, they're anonymous. Then they may see an ad, and they may actually appear on your site, for instance, if you're lucky, but they're still pseudonymous. You don't know anything about them. You, you, they are literally uh, you know, uh, an alphanumeric string if you're lucky enough to drop a first party cookie on them, or they're not. So they're just a set of behaviors. But that's all, if they give you consent, you can start building up a profile, even though you don't know their name. So they're doing stuff on the site. Uh, maybe they go away and come back. Over time, if you're lucky, they become a customer or they, they surrender an email address, they become a known person, and they drift down into this bottom level, which is person data. And, and so even if they're, they could be a prospect or a customer in this state, and you can manage them slightly differently. But all of this from the unknown, the pseudonymous into the known, and maybe you lose them, they change their email, they disappear, they become unknown again, then back to the known. Uh, all of this is part of the same customer journey. They shouldn't feel that they've been handed off from ad tech into MarTech. Uh, and basically, traditionally, the top part, the proxy level is the DMP, and the world on the bottom is what we might call the CDP or in Salesforce terms, uh, customer 360, customer 360 audiences. So both are important. And if you're having trouble understanding the difference between proxy and real in terms of IDs, I give you this analogy. That's the real cat on the, on the right there. That's my, my cat, Jerry. And then the picture is the proxy, Jerry. Okay. So just a pointer on DMPs, CDPs, a lot of three-letter three acronyms. The, um, 
I was talking to someone yesterday and they're like, these acronyms are really not doing us any favors. A lot of the discussions that I have around definitions of acronyms and not as focused as they should be on what's the business problem and what, what tools can we bring to apply to it. I do think that the DMP has, has pivoted quite a lot away from reliance on third party cookies toward more first party IDs and, um, first party cookies in some cases, but also hashed emails, customer IDs, anything that's pseudonymous. And then the CDP category is um, uh, customer 360 audience. We're developing that and it's in, in pilot right now. And uh, that's, that's gonna be an important parallel system. And I think in the future, these systems, they work together you know, critically to cover the journey. And then in the future, they're more converged. So that's where you know, the acronyms go. I think at some point they become you know, sort of meaningless distinction. And then what's possible with all this? Great marketers will be able to do lots of wonderful things. And they'll be able to tap into services, um, technical services, to deliver experiences that really delight their customers uh, and that are, that are more dynamic, that are more personalized, that are, that are more in the moment, that are much more relevant, all of these things. OK, so that's the, the tech part of it. And then I want to talk about brands for a moment, because I think this is critical and actually um, underappreciated by some. Um, and Hollywood, I, if, if one is a brand, so you have a brand or a company, you have a relationship with a, cons a customer, a consumer, you want it to be emotional. You want to take them on a journey. So um, what do we call that in, in, uh, in consumer marketing terms? That's the customer journey. So you all know this. People go from basically like a research and planning phase or an awareness phase to more interest, to trial, to loyalty, to win back. It, they go through a journey uh, with your brand. And you can map it out and try to deliver relevant messages. But that reminded me a lot of um, the way Hollywood handles journeys. And this actually is the hero's journey. If you're familiar with Joseph Campbell, those of you who watched that show on PBS uh, with William Moyers in the 1980s, he was a, uh, he's a myth, an expert in myth. And he said there, there was this sort of Ur myth that spanned, spanned the world. And it, um, it was a common story that really was, it, it, it was remarkably consistent across cultures. And it is uh, echoed in you know, very popular films. In fact, George Lucas was a student of Joseph Campbell. And so if you look at the first Star Wars, it very much had a call to adventure. Um, there was, uh, he assembled his team. He found a mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi. He went through... Uh, kind of a death and rebirth and atonement. Then he had a moment of faith and, and so on. So you can see that there, there is a kind of an error story. And I thought, well, what about the customer journey? What if we as brands treat the customer journey like a hero journey? And I don't not to trivialize it, but we, if I have a brand, I am taking my customer through different stages. And how do I engage them? How do I engage them the way Hollywood might? Well, what would that require? So what that does require, it requires a user profile. You need to know the state of the customer. You need to develop a trusted relationship so you know what state they're in with your brand. You know, at the very least, in the old days, we think of them as being in awareness or consideration or you know, trial. Uh, you've got to be better than that. It's got to be more flexible. And you've got to know sort of nuances of where they are in the journey. And that requires this unified user profile. See? It's all coming back. <laughs> Unified user profile. The other thing is creative assets, and this is not done enough, can be separated into elements. So you don't have to, if you have 100 million customers, if you're lucky enough, you don't have to create 150 million or 100 million different messages or 100 million different ads or 100 million different websites. You can create a few and then have interchangeable elements that can be swapped in and out. And this is a real ad that uh, I got the permission to show from a company called Demand Base. It's very clever. It's actually for dynamic creative. And this is a, a common application of dynamism in advertising. But anything, a website, a mobile app, can be separated into elements and recombined based on what you know about where that person is in the journey. So I think that's, that's where that's going. And then you may ask, why am I showing you this person? Um, this is, <laughs> some of you may not know, although I would doubt it, uh, this is Taylor Swift. So I became very fascinated with Taylor Swift as a brand. Uh, I'm studying her as a brand. I did actually quantitative research into her as a brand, and I wrote up, you can Google it, actually, I wrote up a bunch of stuff. And um, she was fascinating for a lot of reasons, but I think she, what she does is she reveals what it means to be a modern brand. And I'll just give you one example. So I, I surveyed a bunch of people and they're, you know, how do you feel about Taylor Swift? And there is a group, 20%, this is a few years ago, one in five say they hate her. 
How do you feel about Taylor Swift? I hate her. So I thought, wow, who are these people? I mean, how is this possible? Who are these people? And so I, I asked a follow-up. This is online. I asked a follow-up question. Of those people who said they hated Taylor Swift, asked this question here, which is, um, how are you feeling today? Like, how do you feel right now? And the answer that we got was this, you know, most of them don't feel so good. They're totally miserable, kind of sad. So the, the conclusion I reached is that people who say they hate Taylor Swift actually hate life. They just hate, they hate life, they hate themselves, they're miserable people. And so essentially Taylor Swift herself, it doesn't exist. She's a blank space, if you don't mind the pun, upon which people project themselves. They, they project how they feel about themselves. They project, and this can be very good for a brand. Um, it's good for her as a brand, because we find that people on the left and the right until recently uh, liked her equally. They, they kind of assumed she agreed with them. People who liked wrestling or people who liked um, women comedians liked her equally. Why? Because they assumed, I suppose, that she liked wrestling and that she you know, liked women comedians. So the people are projecting like, like crazy onto Taylor Swift. And modern brands, I think a modern brand has to be that kind of a blank space. They, uh, how much do we know about somebody like Google? Uh, I, I don't know, unless you're in the tech business. I mean, I suppose we are. But uh, if you're a consumer out there, you probably don't know much and you can project whatever you want onto them. Um, so that's a modern, what I would call an unbrand. And I think that's good because that means personalization can go farther than you think. Uh, you can personalize to what you know about a person and they will meet you halfway. They will meet you halfway as a brand. And this is an example from the Video Music Awards where Taylor herself knew what was happening. There were 15 different versions of her up there and they were talking to each other and the question was raised by her, which one's the real Taylor? And she said, all of them are and none of them. And that's true for a modern brand. All the versions are the brand and none of them are the brand. Um, rewind. Cats rule the internet. You can see I sort of like cats. And <laughs> one last theory here, if I may, in the, in the uh, playful spirit of the, of the conference. Uh, I think cats and Taylor Swift have a lot in common too. Why are cats so popular on the internet? They, they're actually more popular than dogs, even though you know some might argue dogs are superior pets. Um, cats are a blank slate. We don't know what they're thinking, and it's because they're not expressive. They, they, don't, they don't have expression. If you look at them, they're attractive. They're an attractive animal. But we, we literally can make them think whatever we want, and we can imagine that they're thinking whatever we want. I would say that that's sort of what Taylor does. Anyway, just a theory. CDP is an evolution of CRM. As I said, there are four forces impacting marketing, massive integration, uh, identity management, AI, and contextual relevance. And then the vision of the product, the product vision for the future is start with a unified profile, customer 360, most important, then be able to plan and react and then engage across the channels of choice. Uh, in terms of the brand, think of the customer journey as a hero's journey, you know, engage emotionally. Creative can and will be automated more and more over time. And then every business is now show business. And the platform approach to marketing is, is what we're trying to, to build, not um, uh, to belabor this point, but customer 360, I mean, that's what it is. It's basically the single view of the customer that will apply across the enterprise. So that's the vision and that's the goal. And hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, I'll stick around for a few minutes if anybody had anything they wanted to to chat about and please uh, follow me on Twitter if you'd like, send me an email, that's my contact right there. And I will um, get out of this mode. Dogs are superior, okay. Um, yeah, you know, I have a dog uh, also, I have a Bernese Mountain Dog. And I know that, uh, yeah, and I will I will provide the slide deck for people who, who want it. And um, I, I'm not gonna go over too long, I think I've already gone over a bit. But um, I have a Bernese Mountain Dog and, and I love the dog. Uh, dogs are very different. The, my dog is always happy to see me, which I cannot say for my family members. And um, I also adore my cat because of her, her great mysterious, his great mysteriousness. So I think that they balance one, each other. I would have one of each. Um, but I think as a marketer, I'm far more fascinated by cats. The Marketing Secrets of Cats is, uh, is a book that's yet to be written. And uh, let me see if there's any other questions here. Data bias, yeah, that's possible. Dogs are superior, miserable people hate Taylor Swift. <laughs> Joseph Campbell, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll make the slide deck available. Um, the, 
the Joseph Campbell point is a good one. It, it's uh, he has the hero has a thousand faces was was a book that he wrote. That's that's his best known one, and it, it can be a little um, abstruse. It's not hard to read, but it's a bunch of stories. But if you watch the, you can find it on actually on um, Netflix, I think, or Amazon Prime. The the documentary that it was just a series of interviews he did with um, William Moyers in the past, and he and they're captivating. I mean, they're really good. He's a great storyteller, and he'll go through all the different myths, and he explains how there's similarities in the myths. And and in fact, if you look at screenplays, and I did this in, in the past, um, uh, there is a formula, and it, it, it kind of follows that formula, so it's fascinating. So I got a question on with GDPR, CCPA, and platforms eliminating cookies, uh, what this move away from third-party data means for marketers. Uh, what we are counseling our, our customers to do, um, and it's it only applies to the Chrome browser, because in the other browsers, you can't use third-party cookies already. That's been reality. And apps don't use cookies. So it's a, it's a minority of the market. Uh, 2022, there will be no third-party tracking cookies. Google has said there'll be a replacement. We don't know what to be determined. Um, but I think that what that means is that there is much more of an emphasis now on first party data. And even within the DMP, you can set a first party cookie. First party cookies without too much trouble, it's just a configuration. People who come to your site, um, who, who, um, who come to any of your properties, you can drop a first party cookie in their browser and it will be more persistent. So that's a great place to start. Then, um, for instance, publishers and brands are trying to get people to, they're, they're trying to provide enough value that people will then give them another more persistent identifier similar to something like an email. So I think the move toward collecting first party identifiers and first party data is, is real. It makes a lot of sense. It's harder for some than others, but it's something that every company should be looking at. Um, so I, I don't want to oversay my welcome, but I will answer a couple more. Hey, Adam, Columbia, nice to meet you. Um, COVID-19 create any limitations in the future? Uh, COVID, uh, COVID has done a couple things. I think it's the, the real punchline here is the massive digitization. I mean, everything has become virtual basically overnight. And so I think all it, what it has done is accelerated the digital transformation that was already underway. We all see that. But television, for instance, I mean, th there are major brands moving money out of linear into connected TV. Why? People are still watching linear, even though it's COVID-19. Uh, they're sitting at home. I think it's just an awareness of the the, uh, the richness of data that's available in connected and addressable platforms. So I think this, this digital transformation is no joke. Um, and I think we've all become a lot more comfortable more comfortable in the digital world. And unfortunately, we're spending more and more time on our digital platform. So, so I will wrap up now. Um, I really am happy to take emails or Twitters from you guys. And uh, hopefully that was helpful. And I hope you enjoy the, uh, the rest of your, uh, your session at the summit. So thank you again for, for attending.